Oh, uh, this is inclusion. I have coffee black. And then I add white. Hey, remember Larry Storch, the comic? He used to do this thing, Pussy Green. Boy, what a story is that. I'd love to have him as a guest one time. He should tell you that story. Anybody who was a friar, the Friars Club, with all comics, they would know the story of Pussy Green. It's a beautiful story about a, a Western superhero. Anyway, moving along. It's the Ode to a Roach. Today, I found a dead roach. In Florida, that's a very unusual thing because... Uh, they avoid us and they know how to get away with everything, but you know what? I found a dead one today. And uh, it was uh, probably because I used too much Lysol around the house. It, they, see, they don't like any of this cleanliness. They say that roaches are, are, are dirty. They indicate uh, uh, dirt. And, and uh, ants, you know, we, we don't like them around our food. Some people get mad when I have the bird eating some of my cheesecake out of the uh, pan when I'm cooking it. People get mad at everything when it comes to cleanliness, you know. Yet, what's behind the curtain is sometimes uh, frightening. Uh, chefs will tell you. Even Julia Child used to say, Well, when you're making a crepe, there is the public side, which is the beautiful, smooth, pancake, silk look, and then there's the private side, which has all the flaws in it and the holes. And that's the way it is in life, you know. You have a public side and a private side. That's that's it. What's your motivation? You know, that's an acting thing. In uh, method acting, they used to teach that. What's your motivation? Like Al Pacino, he went to that school, or Marlon Brando, those actors. Hey, why are you motivated? What motivates you? Uh, usually these days it's, uh, well, survival <laughs> with the pandemic. The other motivation would be money. People love money. They love, we love money because money represents, it used to represent our work. Now it just represents freedom and getting the hell away from work. <laughs> I, when I was a kid and we were 12, 13 years old, I don't think anybody in the neighborhood, I was the last, we were the last of the white families in a black neighborhood. And I don't think any of us, uh, there's a reason I'm saying this, uh, were sitting there talking about a sexy portfolio or a, a 401k. We were telling, we were saying, F U C K. We didn't, <laughs> didn't have a four hundred one k. We were different uh, in those days, and now, well, you know, the world has evolved. It's changed. Otherwise, we'd be dating pilgrims. And you know, there's something that is to be said about adventuresome living. Pretty soon, when the planet gets straightened out, if we uh, live that long, and I can see my face on a Smucker's jar with Al Roker. Uh, I hope to see his face on a smucker's jar. That's what they put you up on the Today Show when you're 100 years old. Or Mine would say schmuck, just not smuckers. Anyhow, uh, when we have this society that celebrates age and and we clean the planet, what we've got to do is get away from the fossil fuels and and uh, the Arabs are going to hate us again if we do that. You know, everything is a balance, you know, and, and what am I saying? I'm saying that we're moving into a time when we're going to have to get rid of some things and add some other things. And inclusion, they call it inclusion, uh, with black people doing whatever they want to do, the they want to do. Uh, if they're, uh, they are gifted and talented and have a desire. See, I, I'm of the opinion that if you are in this country and you are really truly an American uh, when you are in this country, then whatever is in your crazy little head or whatever your desire is or whatever your talent is, you should be able to get away with it or exercise it or profit from it, one or the uh, other. Uh, and I think uh, some of the stuff that we, that gets in the way besides people being jealous and not wanting you to have what you have, you know. Uh, there's a, another quotient here. I think uh, President Trump is a good idea. You know, how many people can say, I was the President of the United States of America? Less than 50 people can say that. And, you know, so wouldn't, wouldn't he walk away now? This is my own head now. Wouldn't he walk away saying, wow, I did it. I was at the top. I was the president of the United States of America. I mean, is, isn't that, is that enough? Isn't that enough to say that? Isn't that a great honor? And, and, I, and I go home, <laughs> I would say, you know, uh, and even the mileage you get from the Air Force One, you know, I suppose you can use the plane again. But you know, there's a there's a little bit of of, of uh, ego in this. Ego is E G O, the, the acronym for Edge God Out. They say, 
but you know ego ego is a big is a big driver of people it's uh it's the thing we get up in the morning and say, okay, now I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Actually, part of it helps us to exercise. The other part of it is our adrenaline. And, uh, and then we, we are motivated to do something. Back to that motivation word again. Uh, my favorite word in motivation is from my friend Charlie Roberts, who was a race car fan uh, for uh, raceways in, in New Jersey. And he started a company called Motivation. And what he did was he had all of these race car reports, even David Letterman, when he was between takes on his television show on the set, would be monitoring the uh, race reports because he's from Indiana and Indiana is a big race place, you know, uh, especially with the Indy 500 every year. But you know, Charlie Roberts, uh, C-R-A-P was the name of his company, Crap. Charlie Roberts Associates in Promotion. He started motivation, he had motivation. He was motivated. Now, the, the kind of motivation that I'm speaking of is that you really want to achieve something for fame and fortune. That's always a good driver, that's a good motivator. But then there's the other part, for a feeling of satisfaction that you've done something that's uh, soul satisfying. And that's the other part, you know. that Now there is the black uh, phenom. Black people have had the corner on the soul market for a long time. <laughs> and we want to tap into the we, the whites, Caucasians. Uh, we want to tap into that. I want I want soul. I, I used to drive hundreds of miles to see Otis Redding and James Brown for my music. That was their music. And when I became a disc jockey, we never cared about what color anybody was. It was how the... How we were, how we danced, how the music went, and it wasn't even the hip hop era yet. We were still uh, a little bit primitive with that. I loved uh, uh, my childhood and and growing up with all of this music that that we created, that used to sing songs about what was wrong, a song about what's wrong. We were great at it and d delicious, you know. Like uh, I would say that my favorite of them is "War" by Edwin Starr. And I, you know, I used to work with him. I was, when I was, when I was at 20th Century Fox, um, he was one of our artists and he, and he came to, um, I drove him to do his laundry. He had more laundry than any, anybody I ever met in my life. He, he had these expensive uh, suits that had to be tailor made and they had to be given the best cleaning treatment ever. You know, you didn't throw it in the washer. Uh, but I went star, I liked that. And I loved his song. He got a little bit slighted because it was on Motown and there were bigger stars like the Temps and the Tops and Stevie Wonder and Diana Ross. But he, he had this other thing, you know, he had this thing called war. What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. And he, he sang that during the uh, Vietnam War. Uh, I, I always liked that. And then I liked Amen, uh, the Impressions. I loved that. There were songs that were about, I, I wasn't so much Bob Dylan. I thought he was a whiner. And uh, uh, Joan Beige, Joan Baez a little bit too, uh, you know, too, she was too esoteric for me. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't at that high level. I was at the low level. <laughs> I was on the street. <laughs> I love the street. <laughs> that's where you, that's where you learn how to uh, survive. And that's, so that's where you learn how to have fun. You laugh at things because you realize how ridiculous it is when you're all gussied up and dressed up and you've got everything that you ever wanted. And then you stand there and say, is that all there is? <laughs> That's another one of my favorites, Peggy Lee. Anyway, this is my musical journey today. I wanted to give you the Ode to a Roach. I saw a dead roach. That's how I began this whole thing. And now I'm going to have to bury one. I was in school at Bishop Time in high school. And I got, I, I was sent to detention because I opened the classroom window. And, and because the Catholic Church had all these ceremonies, I performed a, a funeral for a bee that died and one of the flowers outside of the classroom window. And I was in detention for a week because of that. Well, I did borrow the priest chasubles and the incense. You're not supposed to do that out of the chapel. <laughs> oh, I've done some other things that uh, we don't want to talk about. Uh, it, it's the way it is. I mean, life, it's life. Have some fun. You know, I mean, get, get motivated. Motivated. Thank you very much, Charlie Roberts. All right, let a smile be your umbrella, but don't get a mouthful of rain.